can't be president without understanding how the media works. Presidents have a love-hate relationship with journalists and vice versa. Today we've had a national tragedy. Two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center. Whatever the media does, it allows presidents to amplify or communicate their personalities. Ask not what your country can do for you. Read my lips. All presidents gripe about the media. Don't get the impression that you arouse my anger. Are you better off than you were four years ago? From fireside chats to Twitter, U.S. presidents have employed the latest media technology to deliver their message. Yet, there has always been an adversarial relationship between the media and the commander-in-chief. Vanderbilt professor Dr. Vanessa Beasley has studied the history of presidential rhetoric with a particular focus on the interaction of the president and mass media. She says the media is our only means of accountability. The founders felt so strongly about that that they baked it into the Constitution, even though their media system was very, very different from the one we currently live in. And frankly, the one that we've lived in all the 20th century would have been hard for them to imagine. But that tension that presidents know that they probably don't trust the media, but they have to use the media. And we as citizens know that we have to have the media or else there's no watchdog function out there. The press has a symbiotic relationship with the president. Professor Tyler Page taught political communication at Mississippi State University before recently moving to the University of Connecticut. The press needs the president because they're able to get stories that they can use to sell newspapers or broadcasts or whatever they're doing, and the president needs the press in order to get their message out. When you look at the 20th century, there is a direct correlation between the technology of the media and the types of communication preferred by various administrations. This according to Mississippi State University Associate Professor of History Richard Dams. So you look at the big changes that take place from printed media to radio to television to cable television to modern day social media. I think we see that that has, has led to significant changes in the ways in which administrations try to convey their message. Presidents need the media to get their message out, but their goal involves trying to bypass the press to reach out directly to the people. This allows presidents to control their message. In the country's early years, most presidents, when they talked to voters, it was outdoors in front of a large crowd. Woodrow Wilson brought the media into the White House, but Franklin Roosevelt changed that with his fireside chats on radio. We're losing no time in getting the government's vast work relief program underway. Tyler Page says it was with FDR when the dynamics of that relationship changed. He said the symbiotic relationship really meant the press had the upper hand, but the balance of power shifted toward the president. Franklin Delano Roosevelt got fed up and so he realized he could go around the media and do his fireside chats, which were radio addresses where he could speak directly to the country. FDR was the first modern media president. This according to a specialist in government studies, Tennessee State University professor Dr. Brian Russell. The fireside chats, the use of the radio, made it so that FDR got into people's living rooms. He was talking to Americans one-on-one -on -one and communicating them. That was a tool that allowed FDR to go directly into the homes of people. My most immediate concern is in carrying out the purposes of the great work program just enacted by the Congress. FDR's fireside chats allowed citizens to have a more personal relationship with the president, says Belmont Professor of American Government, Dr. Nathan and Griffin. What people didn't necessarily expect, and Roosevelt sort of changed that, sort of created more trust in the presidency. Of course, part of that was because he wanted the president to be stronger, and he, he wanted to use more powers, and uh, had Congress willing to hand them over to him, so he also had a greater need to reach people, but he had greater ability through radio. Later in FDR's presidency, after World War II broke out, more than 50 million people were listening to him on the radio. That changed the perception of Americans and their government, and as Russell notes, put the president at the center of our political system. And when you read the Constitution, the first article is about Congress. Congress is designed to be the supreme branch of government. But in the 20th century, with the advent of the modern media, presidents start taking the center stage. And I think that the fireside chats is going to be a first step that's really changing our government, our presidency, our country, and the people's interactions with the executive branch. Hi, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Former anchor and host of Face the Nation, Bob Schieffer, who has interviewed every president since Nixon and covered the aftermath of Kennedy's assassination, adds the one thing that had the most to do with shaping JFK's presidency was what got him elected, television. In what would be a very close election, analysts said the TV debate tipped the election to Kennedy. 
Kennedy became the first president to allow live coverage of his news conferences, and he held on average one every 16 days. Richard Nixon was elected twice, was praised for his foreign policy, but later resigned due to the Watergate scandal. Factor into this equation, Russell says Nixon had a poor relationship with the media. But he did like to monitor the media. He wasn't watching and reading all the news, but his staff was paying attention to it and trying to figure out ways to manipulate the media. When you read about presidents in the media, they mention Nixon not being able to get along with the media and not being able to negotiate that relationship. Nixon said in a 1973 news conference he had never seen such vicious reporting in 27 years of public life. I'm not blaming anybody for that. Perhaps what happened is that what we did brought it about. Don't get the impression that you arouse my anger. One can only be angry with those he respects. We learned just how much Nixon distrusted the media in his tapes from the White House, according to Vanderbilt professor Vanessa Beasley. Nixon really, really hated the media. I mean, it's interesting because the tapes give us the illusion of sort of the private presidency and what he really thought behind the scenes when he knew he wasn't on camera or being interviewed. And to the extent that the tapes show us how much he hated the press, it almost makes his presidency more interesting because you can see, in a sense, that he's being very restrained when he's talking to the press. Beasley says many have drawn comparisons of Nixon and Trump in their dealings with the media, but she notes one dissimilarity. Part of Trump's brand, if you will, is just saying in public the things that Nixon probably would have said privately on those tapes about how much he hates the media. And I think Trump's team must have a sense that at least until this point, that's an efficacious strategy to go ahead and be open about how much they hate, particularly the mainstream media. The quotes where he talks about fake news, he focuses quite often on CNN, but there are several quotes where he talks about what you and I would consider the mainstream network-driven media. Russell questions whether the political landscape has changed so much that only some type of grand media personality can compete for the presidency. I don't think we're there yet. Trump used to have a reality show. Now he has a reality show on CNN, Fox News, and MSNBC because they're covering him 24-7. It seems like President Trump really only likes the kind of show aspects of the presidency. He likes to be on display much more than being in the back room trying to think out policy. Looking ahead... Griffith has one worry. Part of the way President Trump uses social media to reach out is to rile people up. It's not to communicate with them in terms of getting them to think about things, but that does seem to be lately more of a trend, not just from President Trump, but from politicians of all stripes. Is It's less and less about rational debate and more and more about we've got to beat the other side because they're evil, or they're wrong, they're harmful. Page says two things may happen. One, the bleak version. Partisan bashing will continue, media will offer more opinion-based reporting, and people only consume media they agree with. However, he has an upbeat view as well. The hopeful is that you'll have a new group of centrist outlets that hopefully will be able to call balls and strikes and then allow opinion to stay opinion, that hopefully people will start to trend toward, well, just trying to understand objective facts. And it's okay to go to those opinion sites, but also to play from the same deck of facts. Griffith says presidents have varied on how they use the media based on their personalities and what they think is important. He says, do not blame the media. The media provides a tool and how we use it, whether it's as voters and citizens or whether it's as candidates. And how candidates use it says about something about what we as citizens and voters let them do. It says things about us. It's like any tool. It's not itself to blame. It's just revealing of what we decide and the values that we hold. CBS's Bob Schieffer says the best politicians were the masters of the dominant medium of their time. The founders were great writers when most people got their news by the written word. Franklin Roosevelt was the first to recognize the power of radio. Kennedy was the absolute best at television. And there's no question President Trump used Twitter to great effect in the campaign. But here's the difference. I don't remember anyone telling Kennedy, you need to stop doing so much television. But everywhere I turn, I hear Trump supporters saying, if only he would stop those tweets. Susan Milligan's article in the Columbia Journalism Review suggests the relationship between the media and the president is more distant than it has ever been. Reporters, working in what is arguably the freest press in the world, are finding it nearly impossible to accomplish their central mission, to explain why the president does what he does. This is Terry Likes reporting.